Thank everybody for coming. Is the volume okay back there? Is that too loud? Too perfect? All right, great. Well, thank you everybody for coming. You're at the 285 Corridor Tea Party, and I'd like to welcome you here. Um, we have a very full agenda tonight, so we're just going to uh, kind of jump right in here. Um, uh, first, I'd like to start off, if we could. Uh, Ron Lewis is going to come up and offer the invocation, and after that, we'll do the pledge. Would you stand and join me in prayer? Good evening, Father. We would invite you to our meeting this night. We thank you for a great day, some moisture, and the green which we enjoy. And we're appreciative of that, and we're appreciative of the freedom which we enjoy as citizens of this great nation. We thank you that you've given us that freedom, Father, that it didn't come from our government, but it came from our Creator. We pray that we might uh, enjoy that and uh, see that expressed. Bless this evening and uh, those who speak that their interest might be uh, the best interest of our nation. These things are asked through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. So very quickly, I'm going to kind of run through what the uh, agenda is for tonight. And um, so we're going to talk real, very quickly about what is the 285 Corridor Tea Party. We're going to, uh, there are a couple of news stories I was going to kind of bring to your attention also. Um, and then uh, we're going to talk about what's happened in the last month. It's been a very, very active month in politics. A lot has been going on, so we're just going to do a very quick review of that. Um, and then uh, we have a group called the 285 Activists. We're going to talk a little bit about that and some things that are coming up that I'm pretty excited about. Um, and then there will be an announcement period. So all of this is going to happen in a fairly quick, fairly quickly. So. Uh, um, be ready for it to run. Uh, during the announcement period, um, it's kind of uh, open. Anybody who has an announcement they would like to make is welcome to stand up. Uh, we ask for two minute announcements, and so kind of keep them short so we can keep going on, but if you've got a club or an organization that you're a member of and you want to talk about that or there's an event going on, uh, that's going to be an opportunity to uh, bring that up. And then, uh, of course, we'll get to our featured speakers. And um, our featured speakers tonight, um, Fire Chief Bill McLaughlin is here from, no? He's not here. Okay, you, you'll be speaking? Yes. Okay, and what was your name, I'm sorry? Michael Davis will be speaking. Okay, um, we're going to be talking about, there is a, uh, a uh, uh, the Elk Creek Fire Protection District is, um, there is a proposal for a tax hike in that district, we're going to talk about that. And then um, Mario Nicholas, who is the um, who is a candidate for Senate District 22, will come and speak. And Mario is back in the back. He'll be speaking here in a few minutes. And then um, uh, Tony Fabian will also be speaking. Um, he is a, uh, a very well recognized Second Amendment attorney in the state of Colorado, and he's been involved with a lot of the legislative efforts around the Second Amendment going back for many years. So. He'll talk to us a little bit about uh, some of his experience in the past, as well as some of the things going on right now with, with uh, the, the federal lawsuit. So very quickly, what is the 285 Corridor Tea Party? Um, our, our primary focus is on the, the ideas behind individual liberty and limited government. And uh, so we've got some sub points here, but but at, you know at a high level that's kind of where our focus is: uh, free markets um, and and uh, a, a lot of the liberty ideas behind those also. So a real quick news wrap up here. Um, there's a, a couple of things that I, I, I thought were either interesting or uh, some pieces, some things that you might not have seen. Um, actually, this just came out recently. 
um, the Obama phone, um, there's, there's been a reporter for the National Review that uh, went out and tried to secure Obama phones and was actually able to secure three of them. Uh, just kind of an interesting story. Uh, of course, everybody's heard about Obama phones, probably seen the video, but uh, what really, uh, what's going on there is they've got people that are working for the phone companies and they're going out and they're standing outside of homeless areas and they're signing up as many people as they can to get phones. Um, this reporter went out and um, was very forthright, very honest about uh, uh, what was going on, and she said, I don't qualify for an Obama phone, um, but the people still signed her up, and she managed to get three before they cut her off. And then, apparently, if you don't qualify, the limit is three. <laughs> Um, also, a lot going on in Syria, uh, and and most of you have heard about what's going on with the civil war, but there have been a couple of developments that I was just going to encourage you to kind of keep an eye on over the last couple of days. The, the big thing is what's going on here is the dynamic with, um, uh, with Iran, and um, if you haven't heard about this, in the last couple of days, um, Obama has drawn his red line, and he's... Uh, Barack, uh, Barack Obama has drawn that red line multiple times and he's put his foot down firmly many times and then not followed up with it. And so what's happened is that in the last few days the Iranians have come back and they've said we're drawing our own Syria red line. We're, we're putting a limit on, on, uh, uh, on what the United States can do in Syria. So they've drawn a firm red line and they've said that if you go into Syria that it's going to be trouble. Uh, I, um, you know, I, I think the reality right now is uh, when, when the Iranians say that, I have a lot more faith in it right now than I have in what Barack Obama is telling, telling the Iranians and Syrians. So the, the Iranians have said that, and they've said, look, we understand you've drawn a red line in Syria, Mr. Obama, but uh, we're drawing a red line saying if you come into Syria, there's going to be trouble, and then just within a day or two of that, They've now come out and said, yes, th there were chemical attacks in Syria. So, I mean, it's, it's pretty clear that the Iranian regime is really putting us to the test and trying to hold our feet to the fire on whether or not we're going to be true to that red line. So I think that's just something to kind of keep an eye on. And then, um, oh, this is, uh, this is just kind of another fun news story. Um, green, I'm calling this the green card lottery. And uh, this is uh, something that I just found out about the other day, but um, ap shortly after the Defense of Marriage Act was, um, uh, was uh, struck down by the Supreme Court, um, what's happened now is um, they, are, uh, they, they are applying the concept of gay marriage to immigration. And so what's happening right now is that um, if you have gay married spouses that are coming in, if one person is here legally, they, they can claim that somebody overseas is a gay married spouse and now they are coming in through immigration. Um, and again, the, the, the single, this was a news story on a single attorney um, and he had over 100 cases filed and some of those had already immigrated, gotten their green cards and come into the country. So just another thing to keep an eye on. Okay, so this month's been a very active month for uh, liberty groups and uh, conservatives and tea parties. Um, if, uh, just out of curiosity, how many people made it to the Western Conservative Summit at least a little bit? Did you get to see the speakers? Hands up. Um, I, I thought this was fantastic. It was a great event. There were over 2,000 patriots that uh, spread between Western Conservative Summit here in Denver and also down in Arizona. Um, fantastic speakers. Ted Cruz was featured speaker. He um, got a standing ovation here, of course, but uh, also down in Arizona um, after his speech. Apparently, it was it was simulcast down there, and uh, so an empty room, no speakers, but he still got a standing ovation down there. So that was definitely a good sign for his speech, and a lot of great speakers, and also just a lot of good opportunities to network. If um, you haven't been to Western Conservative Summit, I highly recommend that you put that on your list for next year. Um, also, we had the Colorado Freedom Festival, and hey, <laughs> so, so who here was at the Colorado Freedom Festival? 
Very good. And who volunteered? Actually, could I ask the volunteers just to stand up? I want to give the volunteers a round of applause. Um, we were very excited about this event. Uh, we, we worked with multiple different uh, groups uh, throughout the metro area to put this event on. Um, first year it's ever been held, it was held right here, and we had um, our, our, our estimate based on uh, gate attendance and everything else is right now at 330 people in attendance for the first annual, uh, for the first annual Freedom Festival. So we're very excited about that. Um, we're hoping to start planning soon for the next year and to bring more, but we had, again, many, many great speakers and a lot of excitement and a lot of enthusiasm coming out of that. And um, we, had, we had well over 50 volunteers, both from this group, from Evergreen Tea Party, and, and many other groups throughout the metro area. So um, actually one of the things that I think I'm most excited about with this event is this is, this is kind of a coming together opportunity for uh, a lot of groups that typically haven't worked together. We've all kind of worked in our silos separately, individually, and uh, this was a chance for a lot of people to come together and volunteer and meet new people and network. So I'm looking forward to having that again next year. Um, also, we did uh, organize, uh, uh, we've talked in here before about the John Morris recall that's going on September 5th through the 10th down in Colorado Springs. Uh, John Morris is the president of the Colorado Senate and this is a very, very important election. Um, we, uh, we worked with Evergreen Tea Party and um, we, uh, we organized a call center in coordination with the Evergreen Tea Party and also Americans for Prosperity. We were able to turn out 16 to 18. We actually had two different locations that you could meet so that uh, we, we could increase the turnout. We had 16 to 18 people volunteer to make phone calls on this and we made well over 900 phone calls on the John Morse recall. Um, and uh, basically the question that was being posed was have John Morris's policies been good or bad for the state of Colorado? And uh, so, so the, the, uh, the idea was um, th this was kind of a pre-get out the vote. So we're making phone calls to independents and, and Republicans and kind of vetting their sensitivity on, on these issues. And then that will be followed up with a get out the vote effort. But um, out of the uh, people called, this was all tracked through a phone tracking system and everything else. Uh, there were well over 900 calls. 20% um, of the calls, right at 20% of the calls, which is about 180 to 200 calls, I don't have the exact numbers, um, were in, uh, felt that his policies had been harming Colorado. And about 3% um, of the uh, phone calls thought that his policies were helpful. So uh, basically the call rate's about 25 to 180 or somewhere in that ballpark. Um, and so again, that's, that's kind of showing you, of course, uh, if you had 20 and 3, you could get 23%, so that means about 77% of the people either didn't want to answer or hung up on us. But <laughs> that's, that's to be expected. So those, again, been a very, very busy month. Um, with the uh, 285 activists, we've got a couple of things going on here. Um, what I'd like to explain is for people who haven't been to a meeting in the past, we have our general membership meeting here, and then separately, um, so this is the fourth Monday. On the first Monday, we have a, a, a completely different group that meets called the 285 Activists. We describe this as a roll up your sleeves and let's get the work done kind of group. Um, so we have these two groups that meet. Um, the Activist is on the first Monday, so this month it will follow, it will be next, next Monday. If you're interested, we're gonna pass around a list here in a few minutes. And um, you can put your name on that, and uh, hopefully we've already had you sign in if you're uh, new here, or you can put a phone number beside your name. And if you're interested in getting involved in the activist group, then we'll have you fill out uh, the information on that form. Very quickly, we describe this as kind of a roll up your sleeves and let's get things done kind of group. Uh, we focus on very clear written uh, goals that we're setting for the group. and. Um, Basically, the cost of admission, if you will, here you can come and you can hear all the great speakers for free, but uh, the cost of admission for the activist group is that you've got to be willing to commit at least one hour per month outside of those meetings uh, getting things done. So this really is about 
uh, turning out results. And it's doing things like the John Morse uh, phone bank and things like that. Uh, ultimately, this all comes down to this is where you go if you're about winning elections. Here you can, you can find out how to vote on elections, listen to people speak, but uh, there it's about winning elections. Um, let's see, we've got uh, basically within this, the, the activist group, right now there are three main projects that we're focused on. The uh, first one is a voter integrity project. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about what's happening there in just a second. Um, also, uh, we're working on a, uh, um, a project working with the Jefferson County GOP. So this is really uh, an attempt to kind of have a crossover between some of uh, the, the Tea Party group um, and, and uh, people from uh, maybe the, the right side of the GOP, trying to work within the GOP to, to see some of our ideas infused in the GOP. So um, we've got some efforts going on there, and, and part of that will be, for example, we'll do some caucus training early next year and things of that nature. Um, and then kind of binding these together, we have a technology project. And we've been working on a website, and um, that actually we're hoping will uh, we'll be inaugurating that hopefully in the next couple of weeks here. Um, it's basically a database with a uh, front end of a website, and it um, will be used to help us kind of move these other two projects forward. Um, right now, um, let me just go. Well, I think I might have some things out of order here. Ah, I do. Okay, so um, basically one of the things that we've got that we're ready to kick off here in the next two weeks, and when this list passes, please, if you're interested in this, do sign up because we need volunteers for this. What we're doing is we're working with um, other organizations down the hill as well as volunteers from our, our group here, and um, we're going to be matching people up, and we're actually going to be doing some voter integrity walks. And basically what that means is we're, we're looking, we're canvassing areas, and we're, we're verifying residency. That's the idea behind it. And so uh, what happens in a lot of cases is that somebody moves into a house, and uh, they may live there for a couple of years, and then they move out. But when they do that, they don't cancel their voter registration. So this is a, a pretty simple effort to just walk door to door and verify that the people that are registered to vote are actually living in that house still. And um, it, it's just about uh, verifying the registration. We are going with the same day voter registration laws. We are going to an all mail-in ballot. And so um, this is, this is you know, one of the first steps that we can take to combat fraud. What happens is if somebody moves out, um, and, and even without any intention of uh, creating a situation where there would be fraud, somebody will move out of the house, and then somebody else moves in, and then they get another ballot mailed to them. Now we just hope that they're not mailing that back in and signing the previous resident's name. Um, instead of that, what we're doing is we're going to be pairing with some people and doing these walks. Um, we will be uh, talking about some of the other groups that we're doing this with, but uh, right now we've identified some very specific precincts um, that, uh, where there are, are high move rates and we are expecting to find a lot of excess ballots there. So again, there's going to be a list passed pretty quickly. Um, and when that does go around, I just ask that if you would be interested in helping us with this, um, the way this is going to be set up is we're going to be working with other groups, and um, if you have two hours on a Saturday, then um, we're going to try and match people up so that you can go down and uh, have an effective impact on, on uh, some of these excess ballots. Um, also, I put this in here because I knew I'd forget otherwise. Um, if you signed up for a book from Eric Gollum, if you're one of these people, um, your book is back on the back table. Um, just look inside because he did sign them to everybody. And so make sure your name is in there so you don't take somebody else's book. Um, let's see. Uh, Eva, do you, do you have that? Uh, do you mind passing that sign up list? So we're going to go ahead and pass the sign-up list around, and uh, basically, if you're interested in getting involved in the activists, or you have any questions about anything here, just put your name. Um, if, if we already have your contact information, that's all you need to put, uh, put what you might be interested in, 
And then also, um, uh, we, we, somebody will get back with you on that. So um, I would like to take just a second here before we go to our two minute announcements and recognize uh, if we could kind of maybe just go around. We've got a lot of candidates here tonight. And actually, uh, if I could, what I think I might do is just have you kind of stand up and give a shout out your own name and, and introduce yourself, if that's all right. I'm going to start, Ken. My name is Jeff Schrader. I'm a candidate for Jefferson County Sheriff. And uh, is this my two-minute announcement, or will I have that in a moment? I give you that in a minute. Okay. okay. Just kind of tell what you're running for. Jeff Co. Sheriff. Very good. Louis Dior, you're running for Jefferson County Assessor, 214. Hi, I'm Tony Sanchez, uh, also running Senate District 22, right down the hill, uh, Lakewood, Littleton, Ken Carroll, and Edgewater. Any other, any other candidates or issue committees or anything like that here represented? Issue committees? No? I'm Neil Whitehead and uh, I'm with the Friends of Elk Creek and I have a map of the Elk Creek District over here that I'd like people to come by and take a look at and find their house and uh, pick up some literature after the uh, meeting. Thanks, Neil. Okay, and uh, now we'll go ahead and move on to the... Oh, Keith? May I? Uh, we did a really good job on uh, getting people to, as uh, Lauren said, to the Colorado Freedom Festival. Uh, I was involved in the calling, along with John Weissett, I helped with the Evergreen Tea Party, and uh, we, Lauren and I talked about some of the efforts there. I'd like to, I have a sign-up sheet in the back, if you're interested, only phone calls. Try to set up a phone tree so we can only call four or five people and you're done. In other words, and that can be used for a lot of different reasons. Uh, besides just events. But I would encourage you to sign up on the Paul Revere Brigade sign-up sheet back there and uh, just put your name down knowing that you'll, you won't be saddled with 80 calls. You're just going to get a few and then I'll create a phone tree for people to call people to call people. Okay? That's going to make things easier to get more volunteers on the many things that we need coming down this way. Thanks. And that's one of the things that we have not done particularly well. Uh, Dave Murray has been great at helping us make phone calls. Um, and also Keith, um, and uh, basically uh, up till up until now, we've just, I mean, it's been one or two people kind of calling through the entire phone list, and so it's 150, 200 calls, and, and we've divided up into a, a few people, and it's uh, quite an effort, but if we can get a phone, some kind of a phone tree, and also on that list, as it comes around, you can just put phone tree if you're interested in that, or sign up on the list in the back, but that would help us a lot. Um, any other two-minute announcements? I... Jeff, did you want to? If you don't mind. Sure, absolutely. As I mentioned a moment ago, my name is Jeff Schrader. I am a candidate for Jefferson County Sheriff. And in that pursuit, I'm absolutely committed to making Jefferson County as safe as it possibly can be, our schools as safe as, it pos as they possibly can be for the sake of our children, protecting our individual freedoms, and I always want to make sure that there's an empty jail bed for the criminal who really needs to be in it. Um, you know, I, I'd ask you to consider this. The Jefferson County Sheriff's Office is a large and complex organization, 820 employees, 300 volunteers, 1,300 prisoners in the jail who are all very willing to get into the taxpayer's pocket. Uh, we have a $90 million budget and about a billion dollars in physical assets under the control of the sheriff. And so in my view, it's imperative that whoever is the next sheriff needs to be well-qualified, well-seasoned, and I believe I'm that person. Uh, I've been with the sheriff's office for about 30 years, and in that time, I've been the chief of the patrol and investigations divisions, the, the chief of the detention services division, and also the chief of the support services division, where I administered the sheriff's $90 million budget. I think I'm ready. As Ted Mink is required to step down due to term limits, I'm prepared to step up. 
The thing that I want to ask you tonight is, have you ever considered why the doors on a police car are white and the rest of it is black? Really? So the cop can find the way in. <laughs> no, even the fire guy got it. Well, he was, he was a little slower than everybody else. Well, the reason I say that is uh, a few of my friends, Ted and me being one of them, uh, they are hosting for me a pig roast fundraiser. Yes, it is a double entendre. <laughs> there will be a roasted pig, and then shortly thereafter, a few of my friends will be roasting a pig themselves. <laughs> I'd sure like to invite you all to come. It's September 21st at the Golden Elks Club. Have some flyers as well as some uh, donation envelopes in the back. But we'd love to have you show up and, and join us for the fun and the festivities there. And uh, it'll be a good time. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Any other Tony? Hi, everyone. Uh, so, yes, I mentioned 7th District 22. It's a key race there. Whoever wins that Senate seat will probably take back the Senate. And uh, having that in mind, I just want to make sure that people understand that it's going to take bold leadership. It's going to take being strong on the issues, particularly repealing all that we've seen on that Second Amendment, that insanity we saw in the Second Amendment, standing strong for school choice, particularly for charter schools, and for homeschooling, and it's also real important to stand strong on liberty, particularly religious liberty, and also stand strong on no taxes. But having said all that, I also want to invite you all to uh, Ice Cream Social. I'm going to be having that on uh, September 22nd, that Sunday. There's going to be some homemade pies, and my wife will be there, and so I'm really happy whenever she's always being there. And uh, I'm going to have some flyers about that. It's going to be over at the Ken Carroll Equestrian Center at the Dakota Lodge. It's this little area right next to the, where all the horses are, and there's like a little playground around. And children are welcome. So I hope to see you all there. And uh, I'll have uh, some of these flyers back there, and I'll be standing around. Thank you. Just a quick announcement. Uh, one person that's not here that should uh, uh, be given mention is uh, Secretary of State Scott Gessler. Uh, he's officially going to announce his candidacy for uh, government, uh, Governor of Colorado and uh, kick off his campaign. That will take place on uh, September 17th at the Cable Center at 6 p.m. And uh, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Scott Gessler, uh, he is one of the most uh, attacked uh, elected representatives of our Colorado legislature. Uh, they call him the honey badger because he is uh, uh, relentless at fighting back and winning these battles. So if there's a, um, a way to measure a man, you measure him by his enemies, and he's uh, definitely uh, a, a conservative, he's served in the military, he's uh, stood up against the same day voter registration, and uh, so he would be uh, announcing his candidacy on September 17th at the Cable Center, 6 p.m. And they want 500 people to show up to really make a statement uh, um, to the public and to get his name out there. Uh, his name recognition um, is, is not as, um, I guess, up there with the Tancredos and and so forth. So um, if that's someone you'd like to support, again, the uh, Cable Center, September 17th at 6 p.m. Thank you. Very good. Yeah. Any other two-minute announcements? Anyone? Okay. We'll kind of move right on then. Um, so uh, Eva, if you wouldn't mind, one of the things that we uh, do at this point before we kind of go into our main speaker segment, we're going to pass a basket, um, and I think there's one back on the table there. Um, but uh, uh, running these events, doing the things that we're doing, um, and many of the things that we've talked about um, all cost money, and so um, we, we don't like to uh, spend a terrible amount of time on this, but uh, making copies, uh, we pay for this venue, everything else, and so we, we do just ask that uh, if, if if you can give a little to, to help us out that, and to offset some of those costs, we would sure appreciate it. Okay, 
we're going to kind of move right into the uh, Elk Creek Fire Protection District. And um, I got a call on this uh, just just here about a month ago, and um, we uh, have kind of been trying to put together some speakers on it. And so what we have tonight is um, Tom Carby is going to come up here in just a couple of minutes, and he's going to he is a um, an insurance agent with um, uh, farmers. <laughs> Um, and uh, Farmers Insurance, and he's going to come up and talk to us a little bit about some of the, the insurance impact, the impact on insurance related to some of the fire rating systems and things like that. And then um, we will have somebody also talking from the fire department. Um, but uh, we'll, kind of, we'll kind of go there in just a second. Um, Tom, if you could come on up. And um, basically, Tom's just going to kind of give us kind of a, an overview of some of the insurance issues. Thanks, Lauren. Uh, hopefully you can all hear me just fine. I don't know if I even need that. Um, Tom Carvey, I've been a farmer's insurance agent for 18 years in downtown Evergreen, and um, I, I love being in the insurance business. It changes daily. And uh, this summer and last summer, we've seen some dramatic changes, and, and so they asked me to come up and just talk about that a little bit. Insurance companies have, have changed what they do um, on on a on a day-to-day -day basis uh, on how they they look at homes in businesses in a particular area um, they have as I as I try to describe it to people uh, when I first started um, each one of us were uh, were in a piece of pie and, and there were like four slices of pie would all fit in one of those pieces today there's a million slices of pie and we each fit in one of those so so it, everyone has, has uh, or most insurance companies have developed um, such unique and, and very defined ways to, to look at homes and in, in the mountain communities. Um, and so what they wanted me to talk about a little bit about is, is the two, two main ways that they, they look at homes today. And that's one is fire protection class. Uh, which the fire department will probably talk a little bit about as well. But fire protection class basically is, is how well the fire department is able to respond to your home in, in a fire incident. How, what kind of, of trucks, equipment, men, water can they bring to a scene in, in a certain period of time. And so obviously if your home is, is 10 miles from the fire station, the ability to respond to that fire um, is, is going to be much tougher than if you're right next door to the fire station. And so um, as fire, uh, fire departments expand and add more stations, your fire protection class um, can go down. Currently, most of the mountain area is, is in a protection class five or six. There are, there are numerous areas and, and homes that are located in very outlying, outlying areas that are in a fire protection class of nine. Let me tell you how this relates to insurance. If you're in a fire protection class five, you're gonna see a, a fairly competitive rate uh, insurance rate, but if your fire protection class is, is a nine, you're going to see premiums that are double that, and very possibly you could be looking at at working with insurance companies, uh, what we call high risk insurance companies that that have a, a very expensive premium. The the policy isn't nearly as as effective and or good. Higher deductibles. A lot of factors may come into play when it comes to your fire protection. Um, particular classification. So uh, that's how fire protection class works. The, the other part of, of, uh, of what insurance companies doing today is what's called an, uh, a fire line score. ISO has developed this fire line score and they use, they use some very high tech uh, satellite imagery to determine what the brush load is in an area. So there's three main factors. Brush load, so that's the amount of trees, the, um, the, whether they be scrub oak or you know, tall pines. Um, and so uh, the amount of brush and, and, and trees and vegetation in an area that is close to your home. So that's one factor. The other factor is where is your home located at. So if it's on a dead end street versus being uh, right next to the highway, um, obviously, a dead end street, the fire department isn't going to want to try to defend that home nearly as well as they are one that's close to the highway. Uh, the, other, the other factor is slope. 
So if your your home is sitting on the side of a cliff versus on a flat piece of property in in the middle of a valley, um, so uh, obviously it's a lot easier to defend the home down in the valley. So the three factors of an of a fireline score being slope, brush load, and location. So what insurance companies done over the last couple of years is they've taken this information and they've been able to develop insurance rates based on that and and. Um, they've been able to determine whether or not they even want to insure a home. Uh, you may be in a fire protection class five, but your, your fire line score is extremely high. And if your fire line score is really high, an insurance company looks at that and says, we don't care what your fire protection class is. We care what your fire line score is, and we don't want to insure you because you, there's too much brush in your area. So every insurance company is, is developing ways and to, to determine whether or not they feel like you're a safe risk and that's why there's so many things that the fire department can talk to you about fire mitigation um, uh, in your area uh, working with the fire department to uh, come up with um, better fire protection classes and um, the building codes keeping your house up to code which most people don't realize is if you build a new home the fire department comes out takes a look at it and says okay you're 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 up to code here and then 10 years later, you let that house just trees grow up everywhere. Well, you're, you're supposed to keep that home in, within code, and most people don't do that. They'll let trees grow up or they'll plant trees, and, and so it, it changes um, the, you know, whether or not your home is insurable when you allow a lot of trees grow up next to your house. So hopefully that was helpful. I know he didn't give me much time, so I tried to cram a lot in there. So uh, if there's any questions on... Any of that, I'd be glad to field them. Um, otherwise, I'm, I'm going to hang around. So. Questions on the ratings? Or yep. Are we seeing a lot of homes that are uninsurable <laughs> now, or is that something that you would project in the near future because of the severity of the fires that are happening all over the country? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So, um, right now, there are no homes that are uninsurable because we have these high risk insurance companies that I can write that will insure a shack. Why? I don't know, but they will. Uh, but when you talk about your farmers, state farms, American Family, all states, your, your, big, your big insurance companies that everybody knows the name of, when you're talking about those companies, they are, are you know, creating tougher and tougher standards for you to be able to get insurance. And are there homes that can't get insurance with those main companies? Yes, you might build yourself a million dollar home and um, have to have a very tough time getting a, a, a good rate, a, a competitive rate. Does that help? Yeah. Anybody else? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. I forgot, uh, <laughs> Rob reminded me that he found an extra mic for us so that we can do uh, questions from the audience. So I'll, I'll try and do that as we move forward here. So the, uh, um, the next speaker was supposed to be Fire Chief McLaughlin, um, but uh, would you like a promotion today? <laughs> I've, got, I've got Chief McLaughlin's bio here, but I won't take the time to read it. I'll just let you introduce yourself if that's okay. Good evening. Uh, my name is Michael Davis. I'm a volunteer firefighter with Elk Creek. I uh, need to extend an apology to you. Uh, Chief McLaughlin was planning on being here to speak to the group. Uh, he had something come up and he's unable to attend. Um, imagine coming to a Tea Party meeting uh, to talk about a tax increase. Probably a pretty, pretty crazy idea. But please try to keep in mind that we're not talking federal tax or state tax. This is your local fire department, uh, which in my mind uh, there's a bit of a difference. <clears throat> the reason I'm here to speak to you this evening is to uh, inform you, uh, try to let you know that the Elk Creek Fire Protection District will be seeking a mill levy increase of 2.5 mills on the November ballot. Um, <clears throat> the primary funding source for the Elk Creek Fire Protection District is from mill levy uh, taxes on real estate. Uh, we also get income from ambulance charges and reimbursements for trucks and personnel that we provide to fight large forest fires uh, out of the district. 
Uh, we also aggressively pursue grants, although grants uh, are getting harder to come by, uh, and uh, they turn out to be a pretty small part of our budget. <clears throat> The Elk Creek Fire Protection District uh, in 2011-2012 cut its operating budget by 24% or $240,197. Uh, in 2013, the Elk Creek Fire Protection District cut their operating budget by an additional $242,005. Uh, this was achieved through the elimination of one uh, half-time administrative assistant uh, one full-time fire marshal, one full-time assistant chief and training officer by reducing the uh, benefits that were available to the, to the paid staff, the elimination of the apparatus uh, replacement funding, and uh, delaying facility, ma uh, facility maintenance and also putting off the purchase of fire equipment, namely uh, bunker gear and that sort of thing. Uh, for 2014, we've received a notice that uh, property valuations uh, in our district are going to be reduced another 3.75 to 6 percent. Uh, we anticipate that this will reduce our revenues by 40 to 65 thousand dollars. <throat> okay, in 2006 and 2010, we went to the voters and asked for funds to replace some aging fire trucks. Uh, we didn't, uh, those, those requests for funding were unsuccessful. We've still got those trucks. They're now 25 years old. The pumps on the trucks are failing their tests. Uh, the trucks can only manage about 10 miles an hour when going uphill, and all three of them leak uh, pretty badly. They're, they're nice old trucks, but they're getting, uh, they're getting up there. Now the fire d district is in a position where uh, we could end up losing our tanker credit. Uh, a tanker credit, since in Conifer, since we don't have a municipal water system for the entire community, we have a few subdivisions that actually have hydrants. Uh, the, the majority of us depend on the tankers to bring water. Uh, and we have a tanker credit rating that the ISO insurance companies recognize. And so instead of saying that your house has to be within a thousand feet of a pressurized hydrant, they give you credit because the fire department can deliver a tanker with water to your residence to fight your fire. However, the 2012 ISO uh, standards have been updated and they're more difficult to comply with. The next time we get an ISO inspection, we don't believe that our two tankers and our engine are going to pass. If they don't pass, that would mean a downgrade of the fire protection rating for the entire community. Uh, two, three, four, five. I think I'm going through this too fast. All right, the Oak Creek Fire Protection uh, District has the lowest levy rate of any fire protection district in Jefferson or Park County at 4.915 mils. Uh, it is among the lowest in the state of Colorado. The owner of a $336,000 house, which I believe that number was picked because that's an average, uh, is presently assessed $131.45 a year uh, for Jeffco taxes that uh, are in turn paid to the Elk Creek Fire Protection District. If the proposed 2.5% mill levy increase was voted in, the same, owner, same homeowner would be assessed a total of $198.31 annually uh, an additional $5.57 a month. Uh, I'm not an insurance expert, so I can't speak to it, but I've been told by the professionals that if we lost our tanker rating, that homeowner's insurance could go up between 20 and 50%, depending on where you are. Um, <clears throat> da -da 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 -da. Uh, <coughs> As, re as a result of the equipment reductions, it's estimated that blah, 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 fires insurance uh, would increase. As a result of the equipment reductions, it's estimated that the same, home, same homeowner, the $336,000 house, his fire insurance rate would increase $236 a year. Uh, in, show, in some cases, fire insurance policies will be canceled. In other cases, companies will not issue new policies in the district. I think we're already starting to see that. And that's basically all I've got. I can open it up for questions. If we have any questions, I'll 
pass the mic here. Hi, thanks for coming, Mike. My name is Bruce Ward, and I live at, uh, in Pine Junction. And before that, I lived in Berlin, and I've been evacuated from my home three times. And I want to commend you and all of the fire department members for what you do. You put your lives on the line. And it seems to me that this is a no-brainer. There's no question in my mind that we shouldn't be supporting this mill levy, but perhaps even a larger mill levy. What I understood is that it, in a best-case scenario, you can only really handle one fire at a time, given the equipment that you have in your radius. And that seems to me, in this, in this particular time, when every day, every night, we're reading about fires, we're seeing the fires on the TV, it's all around us, and you know, I would um, do anything I can to help support you guys in, in making this melody happen because I love living up here and I want our family to be safe. Yeah. Thank you very much, sir. Question is, what can we do to help? Well, I guess the, uh, the thing you can do to help is talk to your friends and your neighbors and, and make them aware of the situation. Have them do their due diligence and try to investigate the situation, make sure that they understand it. And, and I'm kind of with you. I think if you understand it, it's a, it's a pretty cut and dried issue. Well, I commend you for coming here and trying to sell a tax increase at the Tea Party. But, uh, Thank you. And maybe I can put some questions <laughs> in your mind. Uh, my name is Mike Bartlett. I uh, served 10 years as a volunteer with Elk Creek, two years as a, a training officer as a volunteer. I was seven years an officer with Elk Creek. Uh, I was let go in 2012 for my political views. Uh, I was also the uh, treasurer of the district for four years, so I, I'm pretty familiar with uh, with the uh, finances of the district. I've been trying to get some detailed financial reports uh, from the district, and I haven't had much luck. I did, uh, through a friend, I got a um, copy of the uh, latest uh, assessment, and the assessor says, or the the assessment says that the uh, district overspent their budget by more than two hundred sixty thousand dollars in two thousand twelve. Not uh, saved us two hundred fifty thousand dollars in the state. And if the budget was cut by a half a million dollars in the last two years, the budget should be coming in around a million dollars, which is just about what our uh, tax assessment is. And I, I, I just don't believe some of the figures that I'm hearing from uh, Friends of Elk Creek. And I'd really like to see some, some uh, honest, detailed financial statements. Do uh, you think the district is willing to provide information like that to uh, the <clears throat> Well, I'm a volunteer firefighter for the district. Um, I don't have any authority to, uh, in that regard. I think that the... For, for myself, when the, when the chief provides these numbers to the, uh, to the board, uh, and they review them with their accountants and attorneys and everybody else, and they give them to me, for me, I believe them. I think, I think that they're honest. Uh, and that's not coming from any professional position as an accountant or auditor or anything else. I'm a firefighter. And I have faith in my department, and I don't think that they're lying to anybody. And I've seen what's going on in the department. You know, for instance, right now, we no longer have coffee. If you want a cup of coffee at our fire department, you have to bring your own coffee. We don't have bottled water uh, because we can't afford it. Uh, the paid st the staff that shifts overnight, they no longer get cable TV because we can't afford it. Uh, they told the staff, if you want to watch television, then you need to start up a kitty and pay for your own TV. So it's, it's down to cutting those tiny little things. And again, you know, I'm, I'm just a rookie firefighter. I don't have access to the inner workings of the organization, but I, uh, when they tell me these things, I, I believe them. And uh, I don't know. That's, I, I don't know how else I would advise you to contact Chief McLaughlin. I'm sorry he's not here to address your questions personally. Uh, but that would be uh, my best advice to you would be go directly to him and, and ask him. And I'm sure he'll, he'll tell you whatever you need to know. Anything else? Yeah, I have a, got a quick question for you. You talked about your tankers and being in old and in bad condition. Um, one, I'd, I'd like to know 
um, a little bit about that and and if you feel like you, you can reduce the tankers uh, you know down to two uh, you said you had three I believe uh, we have currently we have one fire engine and two tankers that are over 25 years old okay. and out of that equipment do you think you could re replace uh, three with two if you had modern equipment and I, I think my understanding, and again, I apologize, they sent you the wrong guy to answer good questions. My understanding is that we need to have one operable tanker at each of the four stations. So we need four tankers that will pass the pump test, uh, and it would be nice if they could actually get up the hill. Because uh, currently, uh, our old tanker takes, our old tanker fully loaded from station one will do about seven miles an hour up Conifer Mountain. And if I lived on top of Conifer Mountain and I called the fire department, I would hope that they would be rushing to my home a little faster than seven miles an hour. So, uh, yeah, I, I don't you know, know if I answered your question. Go ahead. Please, go ahead. It does say by making some changes in the fleet, the district can reduce the number of vehicles, the annual replacement cost, insurance, and maintenance. They can go, the revised fleet would be 17 instead of 25. And would have a total estimated replacement cost of three million nine. They do say that lifespan on some of these vehicles are six to twenty years. Our twenty ours are twenty five. So I guess it's even cost prohibitive to repair at this point. And I encourage you guys before you leave. This is an excellent piece of information. It's got dollar values broken down, repair costs. It's an excellent thing for you to make an educated decision. We'll have them at the table. I encourage you to grab them on your way out. But it does reference that. It does look like we can go down. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, follow-up question. Do you know when the last ISO review was of Elk Creek, and do you know when the next one is coming out? No, I don't know when the last one was. Uh, I've been told that we could expect one in the next year or two. Uh, the reason for the urgency as far as trying to make these changes and update this equipment is that it takes up to a year to put a, a new tender in service. Uh, you know, you don't, it's not like going to buy a car off the, the, the lot, you don't just go pick out the color you want or whatever. You actually start with the chassis and they build the, uh, build the apparatus for you. Then you have to pick it up, have it tested, certified, blah, blah, blah. Our last one, uh, 461, we have one beautiful tender that carries 3,000 3, gallons. Uh, it took us almost a year to get it into service from the date it was ordered. We don't, we don't want to wait until we have the ISO test and they say these don't pass and, and then it's kind of going to be too late. We're going to do uh, two more quick questions here and uh, just in the interest of time we need to kind of move, move this on. Um, hi, I'm Melody Messmer. I'm probably one of the newest residents up here. I've been a homeowner for about three weeks. Um, had no problems getting insurance. They didn't even look at my ISO rating. They did look at the Fireline um, stuff, looked at the satellite picture and said you're good to go. Um, I also am a previous Elk Creek Fire Department member. I was a paid member for five years and a volunteer for seven years. I was also primarily responsible for all of their grant writing, which leads me to one of my questions. You said that they are actively grant writing. Between 2001 and 2011, Elk Creek received over a million dollars in grant money, but outside funding is zeroed out on the current budget. Um, area surrounding departments are, are actively fundraising, not only through grants, but actively fundraising to fill their budget gaps and are receiving funds well into from $80,000 to $300,000 at some of our smaller departments. What is Elk Creek doing to raise funds outside of dipping into my pocket? Uh, as I say, Elk Creek is, is aggressively trying to find grants. We did find a, a grant recently for, I believe, around $80,000 for training. Um, one of the problems that we ran into is, is that uh, some of the previous grant administration, we ended up having to pay back $20,000 because the grants that we got in the past were mismanaged. Uh, and we had to give that money back, and that wasn't in the budget, and that kind of hurt us a little bit. Uh, but yeah, we are trying to get grants. Um, you know, an $80,000 grant is amazing. It's going to help us with our training, and we're very delighted to have it. But I think when you look at an overall budget of, of uh, you know, a million plus, $80,000, you know, to me it's a lot of money to a million plus uh, dollar organization. It's a small part of the, of the budget. Does, it, it's, does that answer your question? Pardon me? No. 
No? Okay. Can, if you got a follow-up question, or can I be yes, more clear? Yes, you've got one grant, the only outside fundraising effort that you're seeking, or are there other... No, we've done fundraising? Uh, outside fundraising. We had a car, the rookies had a car wash, which was very successful. They raised uh, $2,500 in a day. Uh, we received donations from the public. Uh, we everybody's been really supportive, you know, with all the fires and, and uh, really happy with our performance and, and how we've been able to handle, you know, things the best we could. So we've received a fair amount of money in donations. We have uh, done other fundraising efforts, but again, you can't run you can't run a fire department on bank sales. I mean, I think they're great, but it's and I, I don't know of any department in the area. Uh, you know, you guys all talk about how we should all, you know, just maybe be volunteers and be like Inner Canyon or, or North Fork and, and hallelujah, let's uh, give us their mill rate and uh, we'll go for it. Um, we've, got, uh, we're, we've got an answer here on the ISO question and then oh, also go. we're going to have time for one more question after this. Tommy, uh, ISO is due next year. And to answer the fundraising question, I've been um, videotaping and attending the Elk Creek meetings for over a year now, and you can find all those videos on my website, mymountaintown.com. The links are on the paper. Um, they do talk about grant writing for grants and looking for fundraising, and they have been doing that over the past. They've won a couple. They've lost several. So they are actively trying it, but they are also, because they've had to reduce staff, they don't have the manpower right now to write a lot of them. And keep in mind that some of these grants they're going for are federal monies. So again, that's still your tax dollars, but that's also everyone else's tax dollars, not us funding our own local department. And that's just my personal opinion on that one, but um, that's still money coming out of your pocket in some way, shape, or form. Any other uh, questions? We have time for one more. Oh. Back over here. I just wanted to address the, um, the comment about giving you North Fork or, or Inner Canyons Mill. The mill levy is one thing, which is one of the charts that is inside your little pamphlet showing Elk Creek at the bottom of that mill levy chart, but that's only a part of it. It's the valuation of the property that brings you in your tax money. Um, North Fork sits at a mill levy of 12, but that only brings them in $156,000. You're at a mill levy of 4.9, and that brings you in, it's brought in as much as a million three, and in the past decade as low as about $970,000. So while you're lower um, on, on the mill levies, you're asking for a 50% raise when you're already getting significantly more money than the surrounding departments, just based off evaluation. So how do you justify a 50% pay raise? Uh, we justify a, an increase in our funding uh, and the need to replace equipment. We can no longer accept volunteers uh, because we don't have gear for them. We can't afford to buy bunker gear, so we're turning away volunteers. Um, and, you know, everything that, uh, that I've been shown says that we are going to end up paying more money one way or the other. We can either pay a little bit in additional taxes or we can pay a whole lot more in insurance. And if that's the case, then I certainly know where I stand on that, that issue. Uh, and yes, if you have a higher density of population, uh, a mill levy is going to go farther. But I don't know. I don't really know what you're, where you're going with that. What you'd like me to, to address? If you have a specific question, Michael. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Michael Davis. Thank you. Um, we, have, we appreciate you coming in. Um, I, I don't know, will anyone be available after this meeting? There were more questions, and I know that, uh, okay, so they, they will stay around after this meeting if you have additional questions. And um, uh, I wish we had more time for this segment, but we do kind of need to move on in the interest of time. Um, the uh, next speaker is Mario Nicholas. Mario is a candidate for Colorado Senate District 22. He's an attorney at Hackstaff Law Group in Denver, and he specializes in election law. Um, hopefully you'll correct me if I've gotten any of this wrong, but um, over the years Mario has provided uh, pro bono services to a number of Republican and Liberty groups, including ours, 
And uh, I do want to just thank Mario because uh, we had some questions about organizational issues and things earlier this year. And uh, Mario was very gracious in his time with us and uh, talked to me about some of those things. And um, then also in uh, uh, 2014, Mario is going to be uh, facing a uh, primary challenge from Tony Sanchez, who spoke with us just this last month. And uh, Mario is probably best known for um, founding a group called Coloradans for Freedom. And it's a group that led the fight to pass civil unions in the last legislative session. And with that, I will ask uh, Mario if you'd come forward, please. Thanks, Mario. Well, it's good to see so many of you here, and it's, uh, I will say it's always very hard to follow up a uh, hero like Fireman, uh, so thank you for the work you do. As we approach September 11th, it reminds me of a friend of mine who was actually a fireman standing in the South Tower before it collapsed. He made it out moments before it happened. Uh, his best friend did not, uh, and I, you know, what he'd always told me was on that day, uh, it didn't take any more courage for him as a fireman than it did on any other day. Uh, the people that go in and help us in, uh, in our times of need. So regardless of where you stand on, on the taxes, I think it's important that we all realize that we all do support our firemen and our, uh, the people who serve us. So thank you very much. Uh, I'm also going to continue my thank yous here. I might go a little long on it, but uh, Lauren for inviting me here, and Lauren for putting, and the other organizers for putting this group together. Uh, it's groups like this that get together and get themselves educated that are going to be the spine to fight the unions that the Democrats put together uh, that have been winning them elections. And now that we have groups like this, we can fight back. And I like seeing it when Lauren's up here talking about all of you who have called into other districts from up here uh, to, make those call, to make those calls and to recall. Because it's important, and you can do that, and you can make your voice heard. It's something Democrats have had for a long time uh, that we are now starting to be able to fight back. Uh, so thank you, Lauren, for that. Also, I, I, do, I, I do like standing here uh, in this particular building because I feel like this is the birthplace of a new spiritual rebirth of liberty. Uh, and that, that's really what you folks are doing. I think that it's uh, particularly apropos in a, in a building that used to be a chapel. Uh, I think that that is fantastic. I, uh, I personally go to St. Paul's Episcopal Church in, uh, in Lakewood. Uh, so what I do think that being here with you folks you are witnessing a new rebirth of liberty. Uh, and that's what we want to, it's what I want to take to the state senate in 2014. Uh, and that is why I'm running. Um, for those of you who know me, you know, and those of you who don't, uh, I'm actually a born and raised Jefferson County resident. I was born in, in Evergreen, right here, uh, and I was raised in Lakewood. Uh, and, and a lot of people ask me why that matters. That matters because I know a lot of the people in the district. I, I've worked with them, I've worked with my community groups, I've been a Kiwanian for, uh, in my district. I've been a Make-A-Wish wish grader for lots of the people. I know that I care about my community. I know what's happening in it. And what I do know is happening is the Democrats are ripping it apart. Uh, just like they're ripping your community apart up here, they're ripping my community apart down there. In fact, just, just a couple of weeks ago, Governor Hickenlooper stood at the steps of Green Mountain High School and talked about why he was supporting a $1 billion tax hike. I went to Green Mountain High School, folks. I went to Green Mountain High School and I graduated there. And I'm telling you right now that that $1 billion tax hike is not going to help Green Mountain. In fact, it's not going to help the vast majority of our schools. It will, it will take unfairly from people in our districts and redistribute the wealth. Now, the way that that's going to affect the districts where I'm living in my communities is I look at some of the failing schools that we have in Jefferson County that Andy Kerr has represented for the past decade. And I have walked and I have phone called against Andy Kerr in each of the last four elections I fought him. And it was time for me to jump in myself. But he's had these, these schools, uh, such as Stein and Malholm and Lumber, uh, that have been in that district. And he's just watched them go downhill. And he said, well, the answer is more money. Well, I'm telling you, Andy Kerr, and I'm telling you, John Aikenlooper, that you are absolutely wrong. That is not the answer. And a perfect example is the fact that Green Mountain High School, when I went there, was an outstanding school. It was at the top of the heap in Jeffco. 
And at the same time, Lakewood High School, which is in Senate District 22, had gone downhill. It was really a school that people didn't want to go to. Well, in that 20 years, I guess I just kind of gave away my age a little bit. <laughs> in that 20 years, you've seen a change. And the change hasn't been because Lakewood got more money and Green Mountain got less. It wasn't about money. It was because Lake Green Mountain was content where it was. The leadership was content on what they were doing. And they didn't make many changes. They didn't adapt. They didn't say, we need to do better by our kids. Now, that might be fine, and that might work in a lot of places. But Lakewood, on the other hand, said, we do need change. We need to have innovation. We need to foster new thoughts and new ideas. They created what was called an IB program, an international baccalaureate program. Now, fostering that change and fostering those thoughts is what made Lakewood now at the top of the heap in, Green in Jefferson County. It is what shows that it is one of the best schools in the state and in the nation, in fact. And that didn't cost more money. That just required people to go out and say, how can we change? How can we do better? And that's why I support school choice. That's why I support a lot of our charter schools. And you have one of the best charter schools in the state here in Evergreen. That's why I support teachers and parents and administrators coming together and say, how can we come up with better ideas? Not simply saying, how can we hold our hand out for more money? Because I think that all of you are here understand that more money is not always the answer. In fact, sometimes more money simply breeds more laziness. It, bring, it breeds more people who think there is no other answer. We don't need to try. We just need to hold our hand out more. And in fact, that hurts us more. I know that because I'm a member of the community, because I grew up there, because it is who I am. Now, I think it's important that that's on my resume, and I talk about it a lot, uh, A, because I know the area, but also B, because Andy Kerr, and I told you I've worked against him for the better part of a decade, uh, walking for the candidates, phone calling for the candidates, fundraising for the candidates who faced him. The second line on his bio is, I went to Foothills Elementary, and I went to Dunstan Element, or Middle School, and I went to Green Mountain High School. And he says that, so you should trust me. Well, you know what, Andy Kerr? I did too. I went to those schools, and I don't trust you. I've seen what you've done down at the state legislature, and I've seen how you've hurt us, and how you've hurt our communities, how you've stolen our individual rights, and how you've disenfranchise our communities. You want to make it all one and the same. One size fits all government. Big government. Bigger taxes. Things that don't work for people. I will change that as a state senator. I will vote against those. I will protect our rights. I will empower our communities. I will make sure that that is the focus of where we are because that is the limited government principle we should abide by. Is that when we have less government, when we don't have as many people intruding on our lives, we all do better. We all have stronger communities and we have a stronger place for us to all live. Now, I, I, it's more than standing up, so that means I need to get going. Um, so let me, let me also, I've told you a little bit about me, but let me tell you why it's important I'm here. I am here because the state Senate can be, can be flipped. It can be flipped in 2014 and we can have a caucus that protects our rights going into the future. Whether that be protecting all of our gun rights, make no mistake, I will protect our gun rights. The gun control that we saw in the last session was absolutely abhorrent. Or, or whether, it's, whether it's simply standing up for school choice. Uh, those are the things that I will do. And we can do that if we get a majority in the state senate. And what that takes is winning three more districts. Right now, Democrats are, are up 20 to 15. We can flip that to 18 to 17 and we can stop that from happening. But what it requires is winning those districts. So if you live in a district maybe that is not as competitive, so a lot of people in Douglas County live in districts that Republicans are going to win already, getting them to make those phone calls into other districts is incredibly important because we can change that. I'll tell you right now, I know for a fact, Democrats bust people from Adams County into other counties to go walk precincts, to go make phone calls. And that's what we'll be looking for for you. Uh, last cycle, Andy Kerr squeaked by on President Obama's coattails in Senate District 22 by less than five points. That was in a presidential year. Now, he also out-fundraised our Republican candidate by $80,000, $200,000, $220,000.
Well, if I can close that gap, and if I can get your help, and in a non-presidential year, I'm telling you I will win. I will win and I will take those values with me to the State Senate. So, before I go on and, and, and bore you all to death, or, or lead you down any two primrose paths, I'll go ahead and open it up for questions. Uh, and, and please, feel free to ask me questions. There have been a lot of, a lot of people back and forth who don't, who don't know um, and aren't sure about things. I am open to answer your questions anytime, no matter what question you have. I have a this is a brave group, though, so I, I feel free to ask them. <laughs> I'm just wondering, after what you've heard relative to the mill levy, whether you would support the efforts to help our fire department get up to its uh, appropriate level of capability. You know, I think when it comes to public policy, it's incredibly important to know all the details. Um, this is the first time that I've heard about the mill levy up here. Uh, I, I am from Lakewood, I am from down there. Generally, I oppose uh, taxes. I oppose uh, raising taxes. I don't, I don't think it's proper. Um, that said, I think that there are some times when you look at local groups um, and, and you have to make decisions for your own community. And, and so I think that the people who will answer that question are going to be the people in this room and the people of Evergreen uh, and how that goes. Uh, like I said, generally I think um, I do oppose taxes uh, and if we can find a better way, then we should. Hi, Mario. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Sarah and I wanted to ask, <laughs> address with you. Uh, Sherry Duro has received an F rating from um, each of the last three years from uh, Colorado Union taxpayers and from the Principles of Liberty. And uh, her political action committee was one of your first contributions, and she maxed it out her contribution to you. <laughs> and. I, I need to know, does that mean that you support Sherry Duro's policies? Uh, well, I mean, I think Sherry Duro has a position on a lot of different policies. And I will say that there are a lot of different people um, who don't share all of my policies who still support me. And that is one of the things and the strengths that I have brought to my campaign um, that I have seen is that I do have people who I will disagree with on issues who still say, you know what, we disagree with you, but you listen to us and you tell us the truth. And you don't always just tell me what I want to hear. I've had that. I've had uh, people when I'm walking doors who say, you know what, what I like about you is that you don't always tell me exactly what I want to hear. You tell me what you really think and what you really believe. And, and that, I think, has won me a lot of voters, even Democrat voters. I got an email the other day from a 17-year-old who said that he planned to register as a Democrat, but he planned to work and walk for me because he thought he trusted me and because I told him what I really thought, and that meant a lot to him. Um, I, I know that a lot of people up here will, will look at that. I, I will say um, Sherry Jarrell has been better than any Democrat, and I believe that her ratings in that are above the Democrats. No. Well, I'd have to look at the numbers. So I think they have. But one of the important critical pieces to really look at is the most important vote that anyone in the legislature takes is the first vote of the session. That vote is for who leadership will be. Because we need to win a majority to make sure that we have a Republican leadership. And that's what I would absolutely stand for, is making sure that I voted for Republican leadership uh, when we took that first vote. That, in fact, we didn't simply have Senate Minority Leader Bill Cadman, that we had Senate President Bill Cadman. That is what I want to see in the future. Mario, thanks for coming out. Sure. I think that's on. Um, one of the real common beliefs of threads of our group, or all of so many other liberty groups, would be the uh, uh, strength of the Second Amendment and the belief in the Second Amendment. Uh, recently, I read the article in 5280 where a lot of people were uh, coming down pretty harshly on uh, uh, Rocky Mountain gun owners and specifically their president, Dudley Brown. And you must have been quoted in there <laughs> five, six times in that ballpark. Uh, can you give us your position on why you would be so adamant against them or what, if there's a friction here or you're, do you have uh, a strong belief in the Second Amendment? And then I do have a quick follow-up that uh, sure. I want to ask you two places. I think that's a great question. Uh, and here's why. Because I support the Second Amendment 100%. And I think that all of the legislation that we saw in the last uh, legislative cycle was, was just abhorrent. And, and if, you want, if you want to look at a reason why Senate District 22 matters, 
Andy Kerr, the current incumbent, took the decisive vote on the arbitrary magazine capacity limit. It was an 18 to 17 vote, and he voted for it. He's the one who passed it. You replace me, him with me in that Senate, and I'm telling you it fails right now, because I would vote against it. Now, now to bring up that article, and, and um, I think that there's a misconception that I'm adamantly opposed to Dudley Brown or Rocky Mountain Gun Owners. First of all, I think their message on guns is right on. I agree with it. Uh, what, I, what I'm opposed to, and what, what I've been uh, upset with in the past uh, from that particular group, is that they haven't spent most of their money supporting Democrats to win in, in elections. And if we had won a couple more seats, and if they had supported some of those uh, Republicans in more competitive seats, maybe we would have won them. For instance, they did not contribute at all to Lane Sias. Lane Sias ended up losing by only a few hundred votes to Evie Hudak. So I would have liked to have seen that group more active in those races, uh, rather than just sitting them out entirely. Now, I'm sure they have their reasons, but that's what I would like to see, and that's what I'm opposed to, is groups who sit on the sidelines in competitive races, groups who sit on the sidelines and don't fight for a majority, a Republican majority in the legislature. Now, I'm going to give praise where it's due. I've seen Rocky Mountain gun owners, uh, they have done putting up an ad for the recalls, and I think that they deserve praise for that. I think that they absolutely did. In fact, one of the first things I did when I saw that, uh, that particular ad was I put out a, uh, a tweet on Twitter that said, you know what, it was good to see him joining that fight, and, and I was glad to see it. So the more that they do that, uh, I think that's a, that is a benefit for all of us with them getting engaged in races that we can win and winning back the majority. The question was, is it safe to say I would have voted against all the gun control bills? Um, well, it's safe to say that, but if you want to be totally accurate, you could say that I would have fought every single one of them. I would have stood up there and I would have argued until I was blue in the face against them. If you want to know what I would have done as a state senator, then all you have to know is that during the redistricting, uh, and actually I'm probably best known for being on the reapportionment commission, I had ACL surgery on August 8th. Jefferson County's sole hearing to have community members come and testify was on August 9th. So I walked into that room with my knee all wrapped up and it had just been drilled through and they had put screws in my knee and it was wrapped up and I was on crutches. But I showed up anyway because I wasn't going to let Evie Hudak sit there and say terrible things about the people in her community, say that they didn't know their community, they should just listen to her. So if you want to know what I would have done, I would have just voted against all of them. I would have fought them tooth and nail. I would have stood by people like Bill Cadman and Greg Brophy, and I would have fought until the wee hours of the night against them. Yes, sir, I'd like to ask you about civil unions. Uh, Sherry and I had several um, interactions <laughs> concerning that issue starting back in 2012, and as I understand it, she was pretty well lead in a committee and jump ship, I think, from the Republican Party's belief systems and standards. And I guess my question is, where are you standing on that? Well, I supported civil unions. Uh, I did, you, and I think, you, think you Lauren... You supported what? I supported civil unions, and Lauren, Lauren spoke to that. And I'll tell you why, because I believe that government shouldn't be telling people what to do. Mm -hmm. If you believe in limited government, government should not tell you what to do. And that's... That, was, that is the principle that I stood behind and I continue to stand behind. And I understand, and I, and I, don't, I don't think the people who, who stood on the other side, um, I disagree with the people who say, oh, you're only bigoted or you're homophobic. You know what, that's not true, it's unfair, and people shouldn't be name called that way. We can disagree civilly, we can do that. Um, but in my particular case, I did because I stood for limited government, and, and I do think that uh, any time that you use the state to impose kind of your values or what you see, uh, even if even if those values are, are good and strong, it, it's a misappropriation of government. And in fact, it's one of those slippery slopes where as you uh, say, well, we want to take away a little liberty here, the next thing you know, they're taking a little liberty away there, and a little more liberty away over here. 
So that, that's, that's my position on it. I think that it's a Republican point of view. Uh, I absolutely do. I think that a lot of, um, and, and I'm, I'm glad to debate it. Uh, you know, it's already become law, um, and so it's something that's already really passed. Uh, but if you'd like to talk about it a little bit later and all the different reasons why I think it is, I'd be glad to talk to you one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, thanks for coming. You're actually a very powerful speaker. Uh, so I got a couple questions here. Um, and as it relates to our taxes in this room going up, uh, the president of our fire board in Elk Creek is a, is a union activist. And, and he supported this FD25, which is the firefighter uh, act. So the firefighter uh, card check, or I don't know what you call it. Collective bargaining act. And, and that's an unknown cost to our district at this point, how we have to deal with that. And I don't think anybody's spoke, spoken to that. However, my real point is that the, the Colorado Union taxpayers has a pledge that I think your opponent has already signed, and it's for candidates, and it, it's a 10-point pledge, and it just kind of follows ta Tea Party values about taxes and a lot of things. And I'm, I'm wondering if you're willing to sign that pledge. And it's not to be taken lightly. It's a very serious pledge, I think you need to read it and absorb it before you agree to it, but I'd like to know if that's something you're willing to do. Well, uh, a couple of things. First of all, um, as far as the speaker uh, uh, issue, I, I actually have to credit Scott Gessler for that. Um, so, so many of you know, uh, I actually worked with Scott Gessler for years. Um, he, we were at the same law firm and we worked side by side fighting a lot of the unions um, for, for years. Uh, so I learned it at his heels and I'm kind of uh, doing that now. So I want to thank him for that. Um, as far as public unions go, I, I, I'm adamantly opposed to them. And here's why. Because a lot of people talk about unions and, well, the unions are to fight for the little guy against the greedy corporation. Well, when you're talking about a public union, who is the greedy corporation? You guys. You're the greedy corporation. That's who they're talking about. And now I do think that we should support our firemen, our policemen. Uh, I do think we need to support our teachers and we need to value them. Uh, but I don't think that we need to put them, pit them against each other and pit them against the people that they're serving. And I think that's a lot of times what unions do. So I'm pretty adamantly opposed to uh, public unions. In fact, one of the very first uh, things that I did when I got to law school and interned with Scott Gesser was uh, we had a lawsuit against the Colorado Education Association and the Poudre Education Association. Uh, regarding the uh, taxpayers, the, the uh, cut pledge, um, I, I need to look at it. I don't think that you ever sign yourself over entirely. I agree with all of it. Um, and in fact, I think in some places they don't go far enough. Um, for instance, I, I think I look at this, uh, this, this tax hike, and people keep calling it a tax hike for the school finance board. Folks, it's not a tax hike. I agree when Governor Hickenlooper says that you shouldn't call it a tax hike. You want to know why? Because it's blackmail. It's ransom. When you say we will fix something, but only if you give us money, um, but there's no other way to do it, then I think that's what you're doing. I think that, especially when you've got proven school choice, uh, that we have that can make that difference without that money, without a billion dollars. And I'll, and I'll tell you this, Jefferson County, you should all know this. Jefferson County will be a net giver uh, under that plan. We will send $140 million more to the state than we get back. So your taxes go up and you actually get less for it. Um, so, uh, you know, I think, I think one of the important pieces is you've got to look at things like that and you've got to say, how can I actually fight harder? Um, not, not, oh, I'll just send my name there, but ask me about the policy. Let's get in depth about the policy. Because I think that's of critical importance. We'll just do one more quick question if we can, and then we will move on to the next segment. Thank you. Mario, thanks for coming. Uh, my question is, uh, what is your position on illegal immigration? And specifically, what do you think of the uh, immigration proposed immigration bill presented by Marco Rubio and uh, the Gang of Eight? 
You know, I, I, so uh, I, I think that this is important to address because even though it's a federal issue, um, Colorado does it is a place where we see a lot of immigration. Uh, we see a lot of immigration issues. What I really like about the issue is that you've seen so much Republican leadership where Democrats have failed. That's what you've seen. Whether, whether you like Marco Rubio's plan or whether you like Ted Cruz who's out there saying we absolutely have to strengthen our borders. Uh, or whether you like to see some sort of uh, movement forward. I think that really what we need to be focusing on is that this is where Republicans lead and Democrats fall down. They fail. They hide. They go away. They don't want to deal with it. They just want it for a campaign issue. They don't want to do the tough act of legislating. Uh, I, I do think um, one of the things that is also under-discussed here, um, whether, whether you're talking about um, keeping people uh, undocumented or illegals in the country, um, is that we actually have a net negative immigration with Mexico right now. Let me tell you why that matters. Because Ronald Reagan talked about a shining city on a hill. And when it comes to immigration, people will claw their way up to that shining city if it's still shining and if it's still bright and if it's drawing them up to the top. Well, if we've got net negative net immigration, you know what that means? That means that people don't want to come here anymore. Um, and now they should come here legally. They should get in line. And anyone who's here right now should not be able to be a citizen uh, or enjoy any of those benefits uh, before the people are already in line. That absolutely should not happen. But because of policies like President Obama pushes, we don't have people who want to come to our country anymore. We have people who are looking at it and saying, ah, America's not so great. Ah, why would I want to make, why would I want to take this risk? And so when you see numbers like that, that scares me because we need a better country. America should always be at the top of the world's where do I want to go and where do I want to live uh, countries. So I think that's one thing we do have to look at as well. Uh, but I do, I, I support absolutely increasing security uh, in, not only just in our, on our southern border, but in all of our borders. Because I'll tell you right now, our ports aren't safe either. And frankly, if we're looking to secure our borders from terrorists, uh, increasing security on our ports is probably even more important. Um, I think you actually see uh, the Asian populations have a much higher um, uh, immigration right now than any sort of Latino groups do. So uh, I think getting into those policies is incredibly important. Um, but I do, I do like the leadership we've seen from people like Ted Cruz, from people like Marco Rubio. They don't agree. And don't get me wrong, folks, Republicans do not agree. We do a much better job of having lots and lots of viewpoints in our party than Democrats do. They just do a better job about lying about whether they do or not. Um, so uh, thank you for the question. Mario, thank you very much. Sorry, I kept on talking, Lloyd. Well, I'm going, to, I'm going to start off this final segment here with an apology because uh, uh, Anthony, um, we've actually had him scheduled twice in the past and uh, different things have happened. We had a snowstorm and we've had different things that have interfered. We definitely wanted to get um, Anthony here and we appreciate him coming up. He's driven up from Castle Rock, so we appreciate that. And um, uh, Mr. Fabian is a, uh, a criminal defense attorney and he's a Second Amendment expert from the Castle Rock area who helped draft the 2003 firearms legislation um, on uniform shall issue concealed carry handguns. Uh, Mr. Fabian also is uh, involved in the federal lawsuit that's filed by 54 of the 60, I believe that's correct, 54 of the 62 sheriffs in uh, 55 now? Okay, now that's good news. Um, uh, 54, uh, 55 of the 62 Colorado sheriffs against the state of Colorado. So he's heavily involved in that. So he'll be able to give us some insight into some of the gun legislation from 2003, his experience on that, as well as um, also talk to us a little bit about uh, some of the legislation going on, right, uh, the, the court case going on right now. So with that, I welcome Anthony Fabian. Well, thanks for the invite. Part of the problem about going last is you're always fighting the clock. So I'm not going to play uh, Henry Blake here and uh, from the original MASH and start talking about the dark days before. Um, I'll give an abbreviated uh, history and kind of talk about where we are in the ebb and flow of um, firearms rights here in Colorado. Um, we talked about the 2003 um, legislation, the high watermark 
uh, for gun rights legislation where we actually passed pro-gun legislation uh, in the state of Colorado. But what a lot of people forget is just a couple years before, uh, in, the, in the 2000 general election, Colorado passed Amendment 22, which mandated uh, background checks uh, for sales at gun shows. And that came on the, the heels of Columbine. And after Columbine and after Amendment 22, everybody thought, well, the gun rights people are on their heels, they're just going to go away, and we're going to be able to run the table. And we started seeing more and more anti-gun legislation. And instead of being defeated, instead of falling back and, and, and going away and saying, well, we just can't beat the tide of public opinion anymore, Amendment 22 passed with almost 80% of the vote. So we said, no, we're not going to fight back. Or we're not going to roll over. We're going to fight back. We're not going to let this trend stay where it is. We're going to reverse the trend. And we did it at the ballot box. And it's important to hear people uh, like Mario uh, talk about changing that, cha changing that leadership in the General Assembly. Because that's what it's about. That is what it's about. And that's what we did in 2002. And only by a few, the, the, the deciding vote then was the seat that John Morris is occupying right now. That seat was taken back by the Republicans in 2002 by a handful of votes, by about 400 votes. And because of that, we were able to pass not only uniform shall issue conceal carry in Colorado for the first time after trying to pass it for almost 15 years, but even more importantly, we passed legislation that took away the ability of local governments to roll back Second Amendment rights. Uh, on, on an arbitrary basis. But since that high water mark, there have been a lot of complacency and a lot of division in the Republican Party, which has always been the standard bearer for gun rights. And starting with the 2004 election, losing control again, full control of the General Assembly, we started to see the anti-gunners become emboldened again. 2006, the Democrats take over the whole General Assembly. But because of, of specific legislators, because of a handful of pro-gun Democrats, they weren't able to advance their agenda in 2006 or even uh, after the, the, the 2008 election as well. But 2010 comes along, John Hickenlooper gets elected, but they still can't advance their agenda. Why? Because the Democrats took control of the House. Again, that leadership and keeping, keeping a balance of power, having that veto, having that firewall against encroachment. But as we saw this last election, regardless of, of uh, the, the reasons or the cause of the finger pointing, the Democrats control by large majorities, both the state senate, the state house, and they finally had the right governor in the governor's mansion, John Hickenlooper. One of the charter members of Michael Bloomberg's Mayors Against Guns group. And I don't throw in their little Mayors Against Illegal Guns, because that group is about one thing, and that's banning guns, banning private ownership of firearms in the United States. And the legislation that they passed, what I call the unholy trinity, three pieces of legislation that, like all gun control, but, but, but these are the poster children, do nothing to prevent crime, do nothing to make people safer, but do everything to take away the rights of law-abiding Americans. That trinity is... House Bill 1224, which imposed a magazine ban on all magazines of capacity greater than 15 rounds. House Bill 1228, which says that you, the firearms owner, who didn't ask for, who didn't want, and who doesn't need a redundant state of Colorado background check on every firearms purchase, you have to pay for that check now, too. 
basically a tax on your Second Amendment rights. And I don't need to tell this group, you give it a name, as they say in the streets of, of certain cities, give it a name, it's a tax. When, when the government makes you pay to exercise a right, it's a tax. And 1229, that goes hand in hand, it says every time you transfer a firearm from one person to another, there's got to be a background check. And every one of those bills, there's a big catch. Fortunately, Dave Copel at the Independence Institute, many of you are probably familiar with him, one of the foremost uh, Second Amendment legal experts in the country, um, well-published, um, well-traveled uh, scholar, uh, professor of law at University of Denver, got the idea that the way we can, we can get rid of this this unholy trinity of bad laws without having to take over the entire government of the state of Colorado, without having to throw John Miguelumper out, without having to throw the Democrats out of control of both houses. It would be great if we can do that, but that's a tall order politically, and we know that. Dave looked at these laws and Every one of them have legal problems. And so he recruited most of the sheriffs in the state of Colorado. And with the help of the Independence Institute, with, uh, in consult with the uh, National Rifle Association, some other pro-gun organizations in Colorado, we gathered a, uh, a conglomerate, so to speak, of plaintiffs representing every interest group for the firearms uh, owners, uh, sellers, uh, everybody who is associated with and uses firearms and depends on firearms for their livelihood and brought suit against the state of Colorado challenging these three unholy laws. Um, the bases in federal court, and a lot of people ask, why did we file the lawsuit in federal court? And the simple answer is, and the unfortunate answer is, the trend in the federal courts for on, sec on Second Amendment issues is trending toward personal firearms ownership. The Heller case in 2008, the landmark case that settled the issue for, for once and for all, at least when we know the, the Supreme Court, it's always, nothing's ever final. But at least, for the, at least for the foreseeable future, that the Second Amendment guarantees an individual right to keep and bear arms. It doesn't have anything to do with the National Guard. And then the follow-on case, two years later, McDonald versus uh, Chicago, where the United States Supreme Court had to tell the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals, based in Chicago, that just like the First Amendment, and the Fourth Amendment, and the Fifth Amendment, and the Sixth Amendment, and the Eighth Amendment, the Second Amendment applies to the states as well via the 14th Amendment of the Constitution. The 14th Amendment says no state shall deprive a person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law and shall accord its citizens the privileges and immunities of the laws of the United States. And still, it took the United States Supreme Court to say that. And again, keep in mind, folks, the Heller decision, the McDonald decision, five to four. One vote. We came within one vote of losing our Second Amendment rights. But we did win. And the trend is, and to the Seventh Circuit's credit, since the McDonald decision, they have, they have followed uh, very closely the, the, the Heller and McDonald decisions, now that they've been overruled by the Supreme Court. But Colorado... Our courts, respect for the Second Amendment, respect for individual firearms ownership, uh, has not been so good. So we actually uh, have, have, a, have a better uh, line of case law, line of, 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 of decisions to help, our, to help our case in the federal courts. Also, we want this to be the, the anti-gun groups have cheered 
wildly the Colorado Unholy Trinity. The reason is they look at Colorado as the bellwether state. If we can pass this kind of legislation in Colorado, we can pass it anywhere. Because Colorado isn't traditionally a big liberal state. It isn't traditionally a big anti-gun state. And if we can pass this kind of legislation in a state like Colorado, we can pass it anywhere. And Dave Kopel and my fellow counsel in this case, we're, we're saying with this, with this lawsuit in federal court, we are going to send the bellwether back that says the Second Amendment applies to all the states. And laws like this, no matter what state they're passed in, at the state level, these laws violate the federal constitution, the Second Amendment and the Fourteenth Amendment. And basically, there's five claims for relief in the, in the complaint. The first complaint, or the, the first claim of relief just basically says, and, and, and just so we're clear, the lawsuit does not address 1228, the gun tax. Um, the reason being is we needed to have unanimity among all the plaintiffs and all the parties uh, on, on what uh, areas we were going to be able to, to pursue. Uh, there was not a uh, unanimity of position on, on with respect to 1228. And if we can invalidate 1229, the universal background check law, 1228 is going to be a lot less significant because it's only going to end up applying to commercial sales, commercial purchases. First claim is 1224, the magazine ban, 1229, violate the Second Amendment. How do they do that? 1224 bans magazines of greater than 15 round capacity. The Heller case is very clear. Not only does the Second Amendment protect firearms, but it, it, it protects all related equipment and accessories that are in common use. And clearly, at the time this law was passed, magazines with capacities of greater than 50 rounds, both for handguns and for rifles, common use, uh, we had several models that use magazine capacities of greater than 15 rounds, especially when it comes to rifles. 1229, how does that violate the Second Amendment? People could buy guns, they're just requiring you to get a background check. As Dave keeps reminding, when we're, when we're making the argument, <coughs> the lawsuit doesn't challenge the constitutionality of background checks. What the law, what we're challenging is the way the Colorado General Assembly has said background checks have to be conducted. The Colorado General Assembly has said background checks have to be conducted by licensed dealers. The problem we have in Colorado is a lot of licensed dealers are saying what? No way, Jose. We don't want any part of it. You're, you're, asking me to, you're asking me to enter into a lawsuit to run afoul of the feds, to run afoul of the Colorado law, to open myself up for all kinds of lawsuits for a lousy $10 fee? you got to be kidding me. Every dealer who's, who's looked at this issue, looked at the legislation, and thought about it from a purely business standpoint has all said the same thing. I don't want any part of it. So, the General Assembly, again, the first thing to understand is people who pass these gun laws don't know anything about guns. They don't know anything about operating guns. They don't know anything about buying guns. They don't know anything about selling guns. They don't know anything about guns, period. Okay. So the, the only thing they know is, 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 is you know, the, the, the Phil Hartman character on Saturday Night Live, the, the Frankenstein character. Guns, bad. <laughs> guns, bad. That's all they know. So, one thing they didn't count, they just assumed that, well, we passed this law and all these dealers will, uh, will do these background checks for us. Why? Because they get to charge a fee. They didn't talk to the dealers. They didn't talk to the sheriffs. They didn't talk to anybody. And in fact, when these groups tried to talk to these legislators who were trying to pass these, these bills, they were told, take a walk. We've got nothing to say to you. So, 
So that's how the, that's how the, the background check law violates the Second Amendment. It is a de facto, it, it, it de facto defeats people's ability to buy and sell firearms on a reasonable basis. The second claim of relief basically says it deals with just a magazine ban. And it talks about the language of the magazine ban said not only are magazines with capacities greater than 15 rounds banned, but magazines that are designed to be readily converted to capacities of greater than 15 rounds. What does that mean? The people who wrote it couldn't tell us what it meant. The governor was asked what it meant. He didn't know. And the governor told the attorney general, uh, write, write a technical guidance on that and tell us what it means. And so they did a little research and they wrote a, a hodgepodge of language that nobody else still could understand. But it basically said, well, if a magazine could be altered in any way, shape, or form to accept greater than 15 round capacity, then it's designed to be readily converted. We said, okay, thank you very much for making our case for us. More on that in a moment. Third claim for relief again, 1224, basically said, because of this, because of this designed to be readily converted language, you've not only banned magazines of greater than 15 round capacity, but you've banned magazines of less than 15 round capacity. Any magazine with a removable floor plate, which means 99% of the magazines out there, could theoretically fall under this category. So you haven't just banned quote unquote high capacity magazines, you banned virtually all magazines by your language. Fourth claim for relief also dealt with the magazine ban because it said that, well, we're, the people who already have these magazines, because they knew it was, it was going to be impossible to, to, to gather them up, because there's millions of them out there. They said, well, those of you who already have them can keep them as long as they remain in continuous possession of the original owner. Well, what do you mean by continuous possession? What does that mean? What does continuous mean? What does possession mean? Again, you know, as, as I'm sure Mario will tell you, he's a lawyer too. And the, under the law, words mean things. And if words can mean, if, you, if you're dealing with a word that can mean a whole bunch of different things, you better say in the law what specific thing that word means. They didn't do that. So again, the governor tells the attorney general, give us some technical guidance on continuous possession. And basically, the, the attorney general wrote, continuous possession means it stays in your possession until it's not in your possession anymore. <laughs> and we said... Thank you for making our case for us. <laughs> and finally, the fifth claim, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that, dealt with, it was kind of a novel claim uh, to the credit of the, the ingenuity of Dave Copel. He said, what about disabled shooters? What about people who rely on the firearm to, to protect their lives? Because that's the only way these people can fight back. What if they can't handle a firearm really well? And they may need several rounds capacity by making it impossible for them to obtain magazines of greater than 15 round capacity you are diminishing or even in many cases taking away their ability to defend themselves that's a violation of the American with Disabilities Act we basically for the first time ever have turned that law back around on the liberals <laughs> said okay the ADA is so great again you know we talk about they're always worried about their First Amendment rights, but the Second Amendment doesn't mean anything. And so, so the same thing, you know, you always use the ADA to, to extort businesses and things like that. Now it's time for you to pony up and say, well, the ADA applies even when it comes to the Second Amendment. Now, I talked about the, 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 guy, the, the lawsuit. So after the lawsuit was filed, the, uh, and, and we address the, the Attorney General's technical guidance. And, and technical guidance is basically, the law says that the, the Attorney General can um, clarify, help clarify laws 
for uh, those who are, who are supposed to enforce the laws. Well, what the law goes on to say is this technical guidance that's offered by the Attorney General is not legally binding on anybody. In other words, that's all it is. It's technical guidance. It's guidance. It's this is the opinion, this is what the top law enforcement lawyer in Colorado thinks the law means. Ask the, ask the CU Board of Regents how helpful that is. Okay. They relied on technical guidance from the Attorney General when they banned lawful concealed carry from the CU campus. Students against concealed carry sued them. The district court in El Paso County, surprisingly, threw out the lawsuit, said, yeah, they were just following the technical guidance. They appealed to the Colorado Court of Appeals, and the Colorado Court of Appeals says, this technical guidance is loopy. This technical guidance, essentially what it says is that the, that the Board of Regents can make up their own laws, or that, that the laws that the General Assembly passes aren't applicable on the campus of the University of Colorado. No, we don't think so. And surprisingly, a unanimous seven to nothing decision from the Colorado Supreme Court affirmed that ruling. So technical guidance doesn't have any, any, any real force of law. But as part of the lawsuit, we asked for the, the, the federal court to issue a preliminary injunction. In other words, a, a court order even before the, the case was decided on its merits, talking about these vague areas, this these designed to be readily converted in the continuous possession. Because a lot of businesses were paralyzed. Gun dealers didn't know. My client, not only do I represent the uh, Colorado State Shooting Association, which I'm president of for the last 13 years, we're the state association of the NRA, the oldest state-based firearms rights group in Colorado. I also represent the uh, Family Shooting Center at Cherry Creek State Park. And when this law was about to go into effect, he was beside himself. He said, what can I do? Well, I, you know, he said, I know I can't sell these magazines that I have, that I used to sell, but also, now, what do I do about these firearms that are, are, are capable of accepting magazines of large capacity, but people are bringing in their magazines, I don't know if, they've, if they just bought them yesterday or if they've had them for 20 years. I don't know that. And even if they say, look, I only have a 10-round magazine for my AR-15. Well, does it have a removable floor plate? Then it's designed to be readily converted. And under the, under the current state law, that's illegal too. So that's why we asked for the preliminary injunction. And the night before, literally at the 11th hour, the night before we were about to go to hearing before Judge Krieger in federal court, we get a call from the AG saying, We've got a new technical guidance. We think this might solve some of the problems we have with the, the preliminary issues. And the technical guidance was completely different from the previous technical guidance. First it said, with respect to the design to be readily converted, magazines with a capacity of 15 or fewer rounds are not large capacity magazines as defined in the law, whether or not they have removable base plates. The base plates themselves do not enable the magazine to be expanded, and they serve functions aside from expansion. Notably, they allow the magazine to be cleaned and repaired. To actually convert them to higher capacity, one must purchase additional equipment or permanently alter their operation mechanically. Unless so altered, they are not prohibited. Why couldn't they have put this in the law to begin with? No fewer than five people that I personally know of told them that. Testified that in committee. And they said, eh, forget it. The phrase continuous possession shall be afforded its reasonable everyday interpretation, which is the fact of having or holding property in one's power or the exercise of dominion over property that is uninterrupted in time, sequence, substance, or extent. Continuous possession does not require a large capacity magazine owner to maintain literally continuous physical possession of the magazine. Yet the old, continuous possession is only lost by a voluntary relinquishment of dominion and control. So, I, as a high capacity magazine, high capacity magazine owner, I can loan my high capacity magazine to somebody. As long as I don't give it to them permanently. I don't gift it to them or sell it to them. 
but I can loan it. And that's all we asked about here. Again, they were told about this, and they couldn't put it in the language. And now, at the 11th hour, before they were about to have to justify to a federal judge why that language was not vague and, un or vague and unambig or ambiguous, they said, Uncle, so I'm telling everybody, and, and, and I think it's accurate, you know, we've already partially won this lawsuit before a single witness has been called in this case. They've already blinked on these issues. They know that this legislation is badly flawed. And this was an attempt, this, this latest technical guidance, to save the entire laws. They are, they are scrambling now, they are desperate to save this legislation because it is in grave danger. Because it is so poorly written and because it specifically attacks the Second Amendment right. The goal here is not just to get the judge to strike it down. The goal here also is to get the judge to use those magic words, mean a lot to lawyers, might not mean a lot to you. Strict scrutiny. The courts, when, 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 when courts evaluate government restriction or government action that pertains to a fundamental right, they view it with, the, the legal term is strict scrutiny. That means that the government must both show a compelling interest, not an important interest, but a compelling interest, one that, one that compels government action, and that the law is so narrowly tailored that it addresses only that interest and does not extend to any other, doesn't have any other collateral or extrinsic effects on people's rights. Strict scrutiny legally is very tough to pass. So, where we're at in the lawsuit right now, um, round one, although the other side will say, well, it was a draw, uh, we won, they blinked, they cried uncle, they changed the technical guidance. Does this mean, this technical guidance mean that we're, we're just kicking back and waiting, waiting for the victory to roll in? No way. We've got a lot of arguments to make. Judge Krieger is a very demanding judge. She's a very exacting judge. She's a very skeptical judge. Uh, she's a judge that requires uh, you to do your homework and make your presentation well. We are doing that now. We're in the discovery process, which means we're in the process of preparing our case, pro providing the other side with our evidence, our expert testimony, uh, getting a chance to find out what their expert witnesses are going to be um, Presenting, and once we have uh, all the evidence in, in preparation, then probably by the end of this year, uh, we'll be dealing with matters pertaining to asking the, the court to make preliminary legal findings with respect to various issues, various claims. Uh, once those are cleared out, basically we, we look at this uh, case going to trial uh, to the court sometime early next year, probably late winter, early spring time. But I guess my, my message tonight is encroachments on our civil rights have to be fought on all fronts. Not just one front, not just the political front at the ballot box. That's critical, that's important, that's where it all starts. But again, in, in the courts as well. And by putting this kind of pressure, this public pressure on, this, this lawsuit not only is, is a direct challenge in the court, but this lawsuit is keeping this issue in the public eye. And one of the most important things we can do is remind like-minded people like ourselves that these laws were passed, these laws exist. And as they're getting reminded very heavily in Pueblo and, and Southern El Paso County that the people who passed these ignored us. If you went to the hearing on these, on these uh, bills, the, the people testifying against the, this legislation, it wasn't 10 to 1. It wasn't 100 to 1. It was thousands to 1. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't even close. Not even, not even by a stretch of the imagination. These legislators knew what they were doing. This is the most blatant act of political arrogance in the history of the state of Colorado. The Democrat Party 
and their leadership basically said, we're going to pass this legislation. We know the voters don't like it. We're going to pass it anyway because what are they going to do? Vote for the other guy? It's time to remember in November. And while you're doing that, while you're keeping it fresh in the public's eye, we're going to keep it fresh in the federal courthouse. Thank you. We think there are a few questions here. Just real quick, uh, on the uh, topic of continuous possession, I know that one of the uh, things that had come up was you, you basically, under the law, under the, the original interpretation, you could not even take your gun to a gunsmith or right. something like that and leave it. Is because, that addressed in the uh, current? Yeah, because, it, it, yeah, because the, the, the continuous possession, as it says, you must relinquish both dominion and control. I mean, dominion is, is a legal term basically saying your legal rights in that item. So, for example, and, and that was one of the examples we used to get the AG to change this this uh, this, this language is, you know, what about uh, gunsmiths? What if I have to send my gun out of state to be worked on? Uh, or what if I want to go shooting at a at a place out of state and I want to I want to mail my magazines to another state and then I go pick up my magazines I shoot in the competition and then I mail them back. Am I now, have I, have, you know, can I get those magazines back? And, you know, their answer is, well, you should be able to. Well, not based on the language of the law. And so that's why they finally changed it, to make it clear that now, you know, in order for you to lose continuous possession, you have to give up both dominion and control of it. Like I said, essentially, sell it or give it away. Sell it or gift it to somebody. The, the other thing that I'll ask for, I can't count, or I mean, I can't list for you the counties, um, but some of some of the some of the suspects are usual. Some of the suspects aren't. Uh, the usual suspects: Boulder, uh, Broomfield. Uh, interesting, interesting ab ab uh, abstention was Pueblo. Uh, and in fairness to the Pueblo sheriff, there was one of those plaintiffs. So I told you we had a kind of a split decision on issues. Um, the Pueblo sheriff was vehemently opposed to background checks. I, I'm, I'm sorry, the, the magazine ban. But he he did support the background check law. And since the lawsuit goes after both, he felt in good conscience he could not, you know, and it, it put him in a tough position to say, well, I'm a plaintiff on this issue, but I'm not a plaintiff on this issue. And so it was just easier for him to, to opt out. But that's the only sheriff I know who was in that kind of predicament. All the other sheriffs, either for personal or political reasons, opted out. But uh, my home uh, county of Lake County, uh, the sheriff uh, did not participate in. Uh, I think um, uh, was it Eagle County, Eagle County or Chafee County? I can't remember. But uh, a couple of the mountain counties also. Um, virtually, I, I don't think any sheriff from a predominantly Republican county uh, opted out. I think all the sheriffs that opted out uh, are from predominantly Democrat counties. So I believe it was. I believe it was politically motivated. You're a long way from home. Thanks for coming down. Do you see any activity for the Democrats to fix any of those complaints in the 2014 session? No, I don't. Because I think um, the, 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 the Democrats, the, the, the Democrats who would be inclined to see some of these fixed, um, the only way I think you're going to see that is, is if there are Democrat senators or representatives who realize that their seat is in danger because of the gun laws and want to be seen as kind of a, a fair-minded person. In other, words, in other words, as a Democrat, I'm not going against the tenant for gun control here, but these laws have problems in them that need to be fixed. So I could possibly envision uh, some Democrats who are on the cusp. In other words, they're, they're in trouble of, 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 of losing their seat because of these gun laws, especially ones that voted for them, um, looking at the, and, and using this lawsuit as the basis, saying, hey, they brought up good, good uh, issues on this lawsuit. These laws need to get fixed. And also, it's possible, too, that you could see preemptive uh, strikes from the governor's office trying to make this lawsuit go away. Because if the, if the General Assembly fixes these before this case goes to trial, the judge could say, well, 
a lot of the bases for your claims you know, get thrown out. Now, they can't throw out the Second Amendment and Fourteenth Amendment claims. They're not going to be able to, to get that. But the, the vagueness claims, the, the, the continuous possession problem, the, the design to be readily converted, if they were to take the, the, the technical language of the Attorney General and actually codify that, they could legally make some of those claims go away and make them moot. No, I, I've, I've heard nothing uh, from anybody that would indicate that there's any kind of plans uh, in the General Assembly to modify these laws. Sometimes you have to think like Oh, sure. And again, if they were smart, they would. Because, like I said, because they could preempt some of these claims in this lawsuit. Tony, again, Mario Nicholas. Mm -hmm. First of all, as a car carrying member of the NRA, Thank you for representing the uh, state affiliate. <laughs> I did not know that you were counsel for that. Uh, but what I'd really like to ask is one of my favorite pieces that's come out uh, of this is that Boulder County, uh, my understanding is they canceled their gun buyback because now they couldn't comply because of these laws. And I, you know, I just think that's stunningly ironic. That's our, that's our number one claim. <laughs> Dave Hopel, I mean, he gets, he gets giddy every time he, th th this comes up. Because because he can't wait to he can't wait to bring this argument home to Judge Krieger. Because and, and he's gonna do it through one of his sheriffs. And the, the sheriffs are gonna testify, I can't transfer fire. My my sheriff's department owns dozens of these types of firearms. I cannot give one of them to one of my deputies and have him take it off in his car or take it home with him and keep it in his personal possession until we've done a background check. And we don't have the ability to go, and no one's going to, you know, I can't go to the local gun shop every time I want to give a gun to one of my deputies. There's no law enforcement exemption in 1224 or 1229. I'm sorry, there is a law enforcement exemption for 1224. There's no law enforcement exemption for 1229, the background check requirement. And that, nothing illustrates the, the absurdity of this law better than that is, you know, every time... Every time I hand my gun off to somebody and they take it for a brief period of time, if we don't do a background check, we're going to I was going to ask if you had any more goodies like that, but I think that was pretty good, too. <laughs> any other questions? I guess I'd like to reinforce our appreciation for your efforts to maintain our Second Amendment rights. I'm just wondering, and I realize this isn't really your field, but... You know, living in Colorado, Columbine, Aurora, certainly have touched all of us, you know, no matter what your feelings are on gun rights. And I'm just wondering, you know, what is the response if it's not to try to do something about the number of rounds that somebody can carry into a, gun, into a school or any kind of public facility? What do you offer as a way of dealing with those kinds of situations? Preventing them. Well, it, it's it's not just me. It's it's NRA Wayne LaPierre. Uh, in in the, in the wake of um, Sandy Hook, he said simply, yeah, "We protect our presidents with people with guns. We protect our governors. We protect we protect our banks. We protect our money. We protect our valuables with people with guns. Why are our children not valuable enough to protect with people <coughs> trained people with guns?" Armed security in schools. Now, in every one of these school shootings, with one exception, the way you stop a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. Now, Colorado had the, had the perfect the, 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 the shooting in the church a few years ago. Okay. Some guy walks into church and starts shooting. They had a trained security person who wasn't standing there in uniform with a gun, you know, but she, and it was a female. Carrying concealed, she was part of the, the church security group, and she took the bad guy out. She stopped him before he killed how knows how many how many people. That that's what's up. The, the bottom line is is taking banning firearms. The definition of criminal: somebody who doesn't obey the law. So how is a law going to stop a criminal, especially somebody? like a James Holmes, like you know, the, 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 the shooter at Sandy Hook or any one of these people, how is banning the lawful <coughs> ownership of firearms by law-abiding citizens going to stop these people? What's going to stop them is vigilance, preparation, and people who know what they're doing. People who are willing to do what's necessary to protect what's valuable. And, and part of that is 
having people who have guns, good guys with guns, who know how to use them, to deal with the bad guys when the bad guys show up. We'll do just uh, two more questions here. This is not really a question, but rather a comment to the last question. Uh, Jeff Schrader, candidate for Jefferson County Sheriff, and, and I think perhaps where part of that response is, is in the conversation that has not yet been had, and that's about mental illness. Um, that, that conversation has to be had. I don't know the answer to that, but that's a conversation that really needs to be had, and it was even part of President Obama's three-point agenda or whatever his agenda was, but that was not the, that's not where the conversation started. And that's where it should have started. That's right. Yeah, and, 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 the, and the problem with that topic is it is so complex and so difficult to deal with for so, such a variety of reasons. And that's why I, I would not disagree with anything you said. But I, I don't think that takes anything away from my response to this gentleman because regardless of the mental capacity of the bad guy, the good guy is still there, and that's and, and that I think is what it's about. Uh, you know, that that was one of the most ridiculous things I dealt with in politics when we were negotiating the Uniform Shall Issue Conceal Carry Law. Bill Owens told us no fire, no no, no lawful concealed carry in K through 12 public schools. Why? I don't I don't want guns in schools. Well, what he did is he did some polling. And the, the, the political demographic that was important at that time was soccer moms. And soccer moms didn't have a problem with licensed concealed carry. People passed background checks and did training. But they had a big problem with anybody with a gun in school. And that, I submit, you know, even, and even in the wake of Columbine, it's like, you know, we could send a message saying our children are important enough. And some, you look around the country, and some school districts are starting to take those steps. Either, either we're, uh, Douglas County is doing well, and, and, and I know other sheriffs are looking at it too, and I don't want to leave anybody out, but Douglas County I know about personally. Uh, they, are, they have a great cooperative effort with the sheriff and the, the, the police department there, where the law enforcement officers are part of the school community there. They have law enforcement officers there, some of them fully in uniform, some of them not fully in uniform, but they eat with the students, they interact with the students, and so they're part of that community there, and the most important thing is they're there. If something happens, they're already there. They don't have to wait to be called and show up. They're there. And these aren't just civilians with guns, with basic training. These are trained law enforcement professionals. Let's do one final question if there are any other questions. And if not, I have a constitutional question in regards to the Second Amendment. Mm -hmm. You know, oftentimes uh, it, it's a ridiculous issue. It keeps getting confused between, oh, well, I have the right to own a gun so I can go to shoot my, my dinner. And then, but it's not the only clear, and I believe supported by the Supreme Court argument. These guns are to defend me against uh, potential invasion of my home by criminals and by the government itself. Is that not a part of constitutional decision? Or, uh, well, that's and, and, and it's, well, it's funny, and it's and it's, that part it's interesting to read the, the opinions in Heller and, and McDonald, but but they talk about that. That that's my one criticism of the decision in Heller. I think they place a little too much emphasis on personal defense rather than. Defense, a, a, a united, a militial defense against tyranny. Um, you know, it's 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 trite and it's oversimplified. Uh, and and my, I'm a big fan of The Simpsons, and I think one of the best Simpsons episodes ever done was Homer gets a gun, and Homer explains the importance of the Second Amendment. If it weren't for the Second Amendment, the King of England could just come in here and start shoving you around. And yeah, it sounds it sounds kind of oversimplified and stupid, but when you boil it down, that is exactly what the Second Amendment is there for. It's not there, as you said, it's not there so I can hunt, so I can shoot ducks and deer. It's not there so I can go plinking. It's, it's not even there so I can defend myself and my family. The Second Amendment to the Constitution is there so the people can stay free. So the government cannot exercise both a legal control, but most important, a militia or a martial control of the people. Very good. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you, Tony. Thank you.
We are way over on time here, but uh, and I apologize for that. But uh, I want to thank Tom Carby, and I uh, also want to thank uh, he's heading out in the back there. Um, also want to thank all of the other speakers, uh, friends of Elk Creek Fire Protection District, uh, Mario Nicholas, and uh, of course uh, Anthony Fabian. Um, we thank everybody for coming tonight, and I hope you had a good time. And I know we had a lot. I wish we had more time for questions because there were uh, a lot more questions that were out there. But again, thank you very much for coming.